So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening. Uh, I'm Paolo Santori, and I welcome you to the second edition of the Economy of Francesco School. Today, we have the pleasure to have Professor Robert Costanza as a, our main speakers and three, three UF Young discussants. So what I will do before introducing you to Professor Costanza, I will introduce the Economy of Francesco I will introduce the, the economy of Francesco in general to Professor Costanza, and then I will introduce to you our main, uh, keynote speaker. So the economy of Francesco is a global movement of young entrepreneurs, change makers, and economists who were invited by Pope Francis to rethink and change the current economic system. It started in 2019 with a letter of invitation by Pope Francis in person, and we were supposed to meet in Assisi in 2020, but then, as you know, COVID happened. And now, after COVID, we will be able finally to meet in Assisi in September 2022, as Economia Francesco means also Fran Francis of Assisi. So the Economy of Francesco School is a global educational pathway that began in 2021 and now, as I told, is in its second year. We really believe that the dialogue between expert scholars such as Professor Costanza and Young Economy of Francesco Economist, is a generative dialogue. And as you know, the title of, the, of this year, of the school of this year, is Listening to Plans for a New Economic Paradigm. Why? Because the first year, school concluded with an important message, that the science of economics must focus more on the global common goods, those goods that prosper if we all contribute to their man management, that are beneficial to all, but also those goods that unlikely and unfortunately we are most inclined to abuse at the expense of others. So if the first year of the school was dedicated to the diagnosis, now it's the time of the prognosis. But let's be honest, you know, rethink the science of economics is not an easy task. Deciding to do it by listening to plants is, seems ambitious. So what do we mean? But, well, when we think of uh, rethinking the science of economics for plants, we mean ecology, but in a very special sense. It's not that ecology that sometimes is similar to ideology, that ignores the human costs of an ecological shift. The Economy of Francesco School has Pope Francis and Francis as its source of inspiration. And both of them are well, well aware that the cry of the herd is inseparable from that of the poor. And the economy of Francesco School is not ecology, even in the etymological sense of oikos, logos, a study of the environment. We don't want to anthropomorph, uh, to render anthropomorphic nature, that is applying human categories to the study of plants and their world. Our aim is different. It is an humble logos, an approach that tries to capture messages, images, suggestions from the oikos of the plants, from their home from their way of living or being in the world. So messages, not prescriptions or easy solution. Listening to plants means learning another lang language that allows us to think about our world and our economy. For this reason today, we are very glad to have Robert Costanza with us. Pro Robert Costanza is professor of ecological economics at the Institute for Global Prosperity at the University College London. He's also senior fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Center in Stockholm and honorary professor at the Australian National University is many other things. But what really interests us of Professor Costanzas as a scholar is that his transdisciplinary trans, uh, research integrates the study of humans and the rest of nature to address research, policy and management issues. So it's, and not by chance, he's also one of the founder of the International Society for Ecological Economics and also the founding chief editor of the society journal Ecological Economics. So the title of his talk today is Overcoming Our Societal Addiction to Growth to Create a Sustainable Wellbeing Future. I have said enough. Now I will leave the floor to Professor Costanza, thanking him a lot for being with us because he immediately accepted to be part of this school and we really look forward to listening what you have to tell us. Thank you, Professor Costanza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paolo, and uh, I'm excited to be here, and I hope you can hear me. I don't know, and and uh, I really like the idea of listening to plants. I think that's, uh, that's something that 
that uh, I think is embedded in what we're trying to do with, with ecological economics. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, if that's okay. And hopefully you can all see that. <clears throat> How do we overcome our addiction to growth? I think that's really um, part of the problem what's holding us back uh, from creating the kind of world that, that we really all want. We know that, for example, we live in a whole new geologic epoch, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, which is, uh, indicates the extent of the human impact uh, on, the, on, our bio, on our ecological life support system. Uh, we live now in a, in a full world full of humans and their artifacts. I think that means that business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, if we really want to create a sustainable and desirable Anthropocene, we need to think and act uh, quite differently. We need to think from a very uh, whole systems perspective. Uh, we can't think of the economy as separate uh, from the rest of nature. We need to think an economy based on the fundamental goal of sustainable well, human well-being uh, <clears throat> and the well-being of humans and the rest of nature, uh, and, and rather than this mindless pursuit of GDP growth, ignoring uh, the rest of nature. And I say the rest of nature because we have to recognize it, that we are fundamentally part of this integrated system. And we're not separate from, separate from nature, we are part of it. So to build a sustainable well-being future, we have to integrate these three elements of having an adequate vision, first of all, of how the world is. So our, our scientific understanding, which is rapidly uh, developing and expanding and improving, uh, and understanding this, this whole integrated complex human and uh, the rest of nature uh, global system. But we also need an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be. Or, part of it. So I build a sustainable world. What are our goals for the future? And I think that's part of uh, how we overcome uh, and part of the therapy uh, for overcoming this addiction is to really build a shared vision of the kind of world that we, we would like to see. Our tools and analytical techniques then I think need to be more integrated with this, this new vision and new understanding. And that's gonna require more whole systems thinking and modeling and our implementation strategies I think also need to be into better integrated. And that's gonna take new kinds of institutions uh, that bet can better manage our, our common assets. And I think a, a societal therapy to help us overcome the addiction. Uh, this is a really interesting slide, I hope you can see. Uh, just showing net primary production over the course of a year and showing how the planet really is, uh, you know, an organism, a whole organism uh, that's breathing and, and its heart is beating uh, over time. And we're beginning to, to really be able to understand how this complex system uh, functions. Um, <clears throat> we know, however, that there are fundamental ecological constraints and planetary boundaries. And we know that we're exceeding uh, some of those safe, that safe operating space, particularly when it comes to climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, the nitrogen cycle, and several other uh, planetary limits are, are being fast approached. So we have to recognize that we're, we're rapidly exceeding the, the fundamental safe operating space for humanity within this ecological life support system. And we know there are nonlinear, that, that, that the world is a nonlinear, complex, adaptive system. There are thresholds or tipping points uh, there are surprises. This is just a list of some of the potential climate tipping points that we, we may be fast approaching, uh, including the, the ice sheets melting, but uh, also a whole range of other uh, potential, potential tipping points. Um, <clears throat> and we know that um, if we don't do something relatively soon, uh, we may be headed uh, to a, ver a very uh, hothouse earth um, future. Uh, one that's not going to be um, very, very desirable uh, for, for either humans or, or many of the other species that we share the planet with. Uh, so I think our challenge uh, right now is to make sure that we don't fall into that, uh, into that hot house earth, uh, that we can, through earth system stewardship, uh, that we can make the transition uh, to a, a stabilized earth, but also uh, one that's not just stabilized in a biophysical sense, because in order to do that, I think we also have to uh, stabilize the system in a um, in a social social sense. Um, so that's the reality of the situation. But unfortunately, that's not the the movie that many people are lining up to go see. It's an inconvenient truth. Uh, <clears throat> and so, how do we change that? How do we change the framing of the system 
And I think what we need is a third movie. Uh, we need you know, a, a, vision, a new movie, a vision and a narrative of what a sustainable and desirable economy in society in the rest of nature looks like. And first of all, recognizing uh, that there is this embeddedness, uh, you know, it's not the economy separate from, from nature, it's the economy in, embedded in society, embedded in the, in the rest of nature. How do we, how do we get to that uh, more integrated picture? So we know we have to stay within planetary boundaries, but we know we also have to create the elements of, of well-being and quality of life uh, for, uh, for, the po for the human population. We have to achieve what Kate Rayworth has called the safe and just donut. How do we get into that and stay into that space? Well, ecological economics um, has been trying uh, to do this uh, for several decades now. Uh, based on uh, these three fundamental integrated questions or goals. You know, first one is how do we uh, create and maintain an ecologically sustainable scale? How do, we, uh, how do we stay within planetary boundaries? How do we create a socially fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between the current and future generations and between humans and other species that we share the planet with? And finally, how do we create an economically efficient allocation of resources uh, when many of the things that contribute to our well-being uh, are not allocated uh, efficiently by the, by the market, they're outside the market and probably should stay there. Uh, but we need to develop new institutions and mechanisms for allocating uh, these natural and social capital resources. Uh, we need to have a, a more fair distribution of wealth and resources, and we need to stay within planetary boundaries. So, why are we there? What's the vision? What's the old vision uh, that's, that still dominates a lot of our policy decisions and thinking about the economy? It looks a bit like this in cartoon form. You know, we have these three primary factors of production, land, labor, and capital. You can see that land is kind of grayed out because there's this an assumption of almost perfect substitutability between these factors um, that then uh, combine to produce marketed goods and services as measured by GDP, which are then either consumed or reinvested to build more capital. And most of our um, welfare is based on how much we consume. Uh, the more we consume, the better off we are. And the bit fundamental premises of this model is that more is always better. GDP is a good proxy for overall welfare or national well-being. This economy can grow forever. The scale is not really an issue. Uh, they don't see anything in this vision that prevents GDP from growing forever. Uh, poverty has to be solved with more growth. A rising tide lifts all boats. And in fact, we know that the rising tide only lifts the yachts. Uh, nature is a sideshow and private property is always best since we're mainly concerned with marketed uh, and marketable goods and services. So we need a new model. We need a new vision, a new paradigm uh, for this full world uh, that, that looks maybe something like this, where we recognize that we live in a materially closed earth system. Everything has to go somewhere. That these four basic types of assets uh, are all required in a more balanced way to produce both conventional goods and services, but also to produce well-being more generally conceived, more broadly conceived. And they consist of our conventional built capital but, and our human capital, individual people, uh, their health, not just their labor, but their health, their intelligence, their creativity, uh, our social capital, all of the interactions among people, uh, our institutions, our governments, our cultures, etc. And finally, our natural capital, everything else in the world that we didn't have to create, the free gifts of nature. Um, and those contribute to well-being in, in diverse in diverse ways, uh, including through the conventional economy, but directly uh, providing a, a range of ecological and so social services and amenities. So better understanding what do we mean by quality of life or well-being, I think is an important part of this. And we know that this is based on a whole, a, a much broader range of basic human needs, uh, as this is one list created by Manfred Max Neef. There are several others uh, out there, but just to recognize that it goes far beyond consumption and subsistence. Uh, to security, affection, understanding, participation, leisure, spirituality, creativity, identity, freedom, all of these things are basic human needs. There's been a lot of research recently on surveying people and asking them, you know, subjectively how, how satisfied they are with their life. And uh, that sense of subjective well-being depends on how well these needs are being met and how they're weighted by different individuals and different cultures and et cetera. What we can do 
from a policy perspective, though, is to create the opportunities for people to meet those needs, to feel the sense of subjective well-being by how we arrange our, our assets, our built, our human, our social, our natural capital, and how we use our time. So ecosystem services, the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems are a key contributor uh, to that sense of the overall uh, constituents of well-being that I mentioned over here. This graph is from the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, which divided these services into these four basic categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services, and how they contribute to the different aspects of, of well-being that we see on the on the right-hand side. Um, <clears throat> one thing that was missing from this diagram, I think, is the interaction with the other forms of capital. So, in fact, to create sustainable well human well-being requires the interaction of all four of these types of capital. Ecosystem services are the relative contribution in that interaction. Uh, with, uh, in combination with social built and, and human capital. They don't flow directly into human well-being, but require this, this complex, this whole system. So this is inherently a transdisciplinary uh, kind, of, kind of science uh, to understand the interaction of all the different parts of the system to produce sustainable human well-being, understanding what that is and how this complex system works to, uh, to provide it. So there's been a lot of um, policy interest, growing policy interest in this idea of ecosystem services. You've probably heard of the IPBES. Uh, if not, take a look at their, uh, their website. They're doing regular uh, assessments of the, the status and trends of ecosystem services and biodiversity um, that you've probably come across already. There's the Ecosystem Services Partnership, uh, which I encourage you to take a look at their, their website if you're interested in, in seeing who's doing what around the world and joining some of their conferences and, and workshops uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, <clears throat> and in the academic literature, there's been a huge increase in uh, the number of publications on this topic of ecosystem services. This is just uh, the number of publications by year in Scopus. You can see that there's more than almost 6,000 new articles per year uh, being published on the topic of, of ecosystem services. The most highly cited of those is this one that we did back in 1997, where we tried to estimate with a capital E the, the total value in terms that are comparable with GDP of this of uh, 17 different ecosystem services across 16 different biomes. We came up with an, an estimate that was significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Um, one thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of the magazine. We did get the cover, that was good, but they said pricing the planet when we actually meant valuing the planet. Uh, so we're not these, these services, most of which uh, are, are not traded in markets and should not be traded in markets, but they do contribute to human well-being uh, in a whole range of, of, uh, of ways, as, we, as we'll talk about. Um, more recently, we estimated how those values have changed uh, since 1997. Uh, and we did a study in 2000, published in 2014, uh, that looked at the changes in those values based on changes in, largely changes in land use, but also updated estimates from all of those new studies about the value of those services. And, uh, you know, because of desertification, loss of wetlands, loss of coral reefs, et cetera, we're, we're losing about $20 trillion a year in the value of those, those ecosystem services, a significant fraction of, uh, of everything that contributes to our human well-being. We've also looked out into the future to see what sort of scenarios um, would imply uh, for the value of these services. The business as usual scenario uh, leads to continued uh, degradation or loss of ecosystem services. We could have through policy reforms, we can basically stabilize things, but what we really need is a great transition uh, to, uh, to restore and rebuild uh, and regenerate um, all of the global ecosystems uh, in order to, to continue to have to build this uh, sustainable well-being future. Pope Francis, in his encyclical, La Data C, uh, certainly had some things to say specifically about, about this. And there's a quote that I, I pulled out of, out of uh, that encyclical. You know, businesses profit by calculating and paying only a fraction of the costs involved. Uh, they're not paying uh, for the cost, the damages uh, to the natural capital and social capital. And it's only when these economic and social costs um, you know, are recognized and fully borne by those who incur them, not by other people, not by future generations, only then can those actions be considered ethical. Uh, so uh, there's a real connection here. We have, uh, we have some unethical behavior going on at, at the global scale. Um, we also know that <clears throat> 
the, um, the, the social capital is being uh, rapidly degraded. And part of that is due to the unfair, the unequal distribution of wealth and resources in many countries. Uh, you may have seen this graph from uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett's book, The Spirit Level, that plots income inequality by country in uh, some of the OECD countries against a whole range of social problems. Uh, and the higher the inequality, the United States is, is way up here, uh, the, the worse this, uh, this whole index of, of social problems becomes. And that also affects our ability to, to collaborate, to communicate, uh, to build social, uh, social capital. We know, for example, that um, GDP, if you plot GDP versus people's subjective well-being or life satisfaction, you get these diminishing return kinds of curves. Uh, there's, there's certainly an increase at first uh, where there needs to be uh, sufficiency in terms of production of, of, uh, of um, <clears throat> food and, and shelter, et cetera. Uh, but beyond a certain relatively low point, uh, there's no longer any relationship between GDP and, and life satisfaction. Uh, and that's because of the other things that contribute uh, to well-being beyond beyond mere uh, mere consumption. So we know that, and and we know that GDP was never designed as a measure of societal well-being. This is from Simon Kuznets, one of the architects of GDP. You know, he said if you really talk, you know, it, it, the welfare of a nation cannot be inferred from a measurement of national income. Uh, because, you know, if you're talking about goals for more growth, you have to specify growth of what. And, and for what, and we haven't been doing that. So it's really well past time to leave GDP behind as a measure of societal progress. Uh, there are a whole range of alternatives that have been suggested to do that. I'll just talk about one uh, called the Genuine Progress Indicator, uh, which takes personal consumption as a starting point, which is a major component of GDP, but then it weights it by income distribution. So it gets in the inequality component. Uh, it adds a few things that are left out to major contributors to well-being, like household labor and volunteer work, but they're ignored by GDP because they're not marketed. And then subtracts a bunch of things that, that really should be considered costs rather than benefits, even though they're included in GDP. You know, the cost of commuting, the cost of crime, the cost of family breakdown. Uh, the more crime there is, you know, the higher GDP is because, you know, there are more police, there's more security devices, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't want more crime. <clears throat> we don't want more water pollution or air pollution or noise pollution or any of those things. So um, this is a, a, at least a better approximation uh, to genuine progress. And when we do that uh, for several countries, and this is just a global index that we came up with by putting together a whole bunch of, of those studies, uh, we find that, you know, we've moved from a period of what you might call true economic growth from the post-war period to maybe 1980 to a period of what we're now in called of uneconomic growth. GDP is still increasing, but gen genuine progress is declining slightly because of the growing inequality, because of the growing environmental cost, uh, et cetera. So we're not making genuine progress and haven't been uh, for decades now. And I think that shows up in people's sense of life satisfaction as well. So <clears throat> what do we do? Well. To create this sustainable well-being economy, I think is going to require uh, breaking our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption in, in high income countries. And a key step in that therapy is really to build a shared vision of what a more sustainable and desirable future uh, would look like, uh, a future based on the well-being of humans and the rest of nature. So one paper that we published recently uh, looked at what can we learn uh, from uh, what works at the individual scale in overcoming addictions, and can't that be applied to uh, the societal scale? And there is a, a therapy called motivational interviewing uh, that uh, has been quite effective, and it's based on not confronting addicts with their problem, but engaging them in a positive discussion of their goals, their motives, and, and the kind of world they want in the future. So the... Um, <clears throat> The analogy for that at the societal scale is building a shared vision of the kind of world that, that we all want. Uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, are, a, I think, a key step in that direction. Uh, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the SDGs. It's the first time in human history, really, when all UN countries, all countries in the world have agreed on a broad set of, uh, of goals that go far beyond merely economic growth to include, you know, urgent action on climate, you know, protecting what, uh, life, uh, both marine and terrestrial life, peace and justice, no poverty, no hunger, renewable energy, et cetera. 
So I think it's a real step in the right direction, <clears throat> but we also have to recognize the, the synergies and trade-offs among those different, those different goals. Um, and we have to recognize how they contribute uh, to these sort of sub goals that I mentioned of sustainable scale, fair distribution and efficient allocation and how they contribute to the overarching goal of a prosperous high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable. So understanding this complex system, I think is really the challenge, one of our challenges going forward. Um, but I think a first step really is building this shared vision of the kind of world that we really want. And um, this is a book that we published where we invited 45 uh, uh, global thought leaders to write essays saying what that world uh, could look like, uh, what would a desirable future look like. There's also been a lot of work on scenario planning, uh, looking at potential uh, futures, plausible futures, and, uh, and describing what those plausible futures are, and, and then trying to build a consensus on which of those plausible, which of those futures we really prefer. Uh, this is from the Great Transition Initiative, uh, and they had sort of a business as usual. I, I talked about these a bit uh, with the uh, uh, ecosystem services scenarios, a policy reform uh, future, and a great transition future that's based on community and a focus on well being rather than a, a narrow focus on GDP growth and individualism. And I think the SDGs sort of fit into that great transition uh, scenario. Um, the the uh, challenge, I think, is uh, getting beyond the policy community and trying to engage the general public in a discussion of what kind of future we want, what are the possibilities, and which of those possible futures do we really prefer um, as the first step in the therapy uh, to help us motivate the action to, to help us get there. And I think if you show these possible futures uh, to people in general, uh, we find that the great transition SDG future is the one that the majority of people on the planet uh, really would really like. We did a um, uh, public opinion survey in Australia uh, with four scenarios that were based on those four J uh, great transition scenarios. With uh, we changed the name slightly, uh, so community well-being rather than great transition and free enterprise rather than than uh, whatever it was. Um, anyway. <clears throat> And then we did a survey uh, with about 2000 uh, uh, participants, representative sample of the Australian population and found that uh, fully 72% ranked community well-being either preference number one or number two. Uh, they also, we also asked them where they thought the country was headed. And in general, they thought the country was still headed for the free enterprise future. So I think people in general <clears throat> would like to see a world that's not the one that we seem to be headed towards. Uh, but we need to describe that world in more detail uh, in order to uh, motivate uh, the transition toward it as part of the part of this this uh, therapy that I'm talking about. Another question co that comes down is, well, is this world even feasible? And there have been a couple of uh, recent books uh, that look at that question, in particular, this one by Peter Victor called Managing Without Growth and P Tim Jackson's book Prosperity Without Growth. Uh, Peter did a uh, computer simulation model of the Canadian economy and ask the question, you know, what happens if you just shut off GDP growth and you can get a no growth disaster. <clears throat> However, he said, uh, you can also create a better low or no growth positive economy with the right set of, of policy uh, changes. Uh, so it is feasible. And a summary of the things that have to change in order to get to that positive economy is this. Here are the 12 steps uh, that we need for the, in, uh, in our therapy. New meanings and measures of success. Now we have to go beyond GDP to something more like GPI. Uh, limits on material energies and wastes and, and land use. So we have to stay within planetary boundaries. More meaningful prices. The market's telling us, not telling us the truth about anything that we buy because it's leaving out uh, the impacts on natural and social capital and all those external effects. More durable, repairable products. Uh, we don't want to create things that, that, uh, that just require uh, more energy and more material to be re reproduced. Fewer status goods. Uh, we need to put place uh, status on things that are uh, that are not consumption goods, that, that things that benefit the community rather than than uh, uh, than just individuals. <clears throat> more informative advertising. Uh, so we want to we want advertisers to tell us what the products do, We're not trying to change our preferences and tell us that we can't be happy until we buy their products. Better screening of technology. Technology is a good servant, but a poor master. So we need to, to incentivize the technologies that we really want to create the kind of future that we've all agreed that we want. More efficient capital stock. It's a corollary of, of more efficient uh, consumer products. 
more local, less global. We need to, and this is not just to reduce um, transportation costs because local economies can build social capital and build a sense of community and contribute more directly uh, to people's sense of well being. Reduced inequality, we already talked about that and why it's important to build social capital. Less work, more leisure. We need to, to have a better work life balance. And I don't think people, many people would object to this one. And finally, education for life and not just work. Uh, so we need to educate people for what actually does contribute to their well being, not just train them uh, to, to make money to buy things that they don't necessarily really need. And finally, I think we also need new kinds of institutions uh, to manage our natural and social capital. And this idea of common asset trusts is one that, that we've been working on recently uh, that we need to consider uh, these common assets like the atmosphere, like the oceans, like ecosystems as belonging to all of us uh, together. And, and they can be managed in an effective way. Um, this is a, a list of design principles from Eleanor Ostrom's work uh, where she looked at uh, cultures that have managed uh, to, man to, to manage uh, their, uh, their uh, common assets sustainably and well. And there's, a, there's a list of um, principles that need to be uh, upheld. They can't be open access resources as we have now for the atmosphere and the oceans and several other, other things. They, they need to be clearly defined boundaries uh, along with a whole range of other things. And these, these um, systems need to be co-designed and co-produced by the stakeholders that are that are running the system. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, work to do. Uh, and I think it's a real interesting uh, research area in how to redesign institutions that can adequately manage uh, our, our, our natural capital and social capital. And finally, I think we need a movement. Um, and uh, I've been involved in helping to establish the Wellbeing Economy Alliance uh, to try to bring together all of the different groups uh, that are saying similar sorts of things. And you've probably heard, heard from uh, some, several of them now. Um, <clears throat> there was a meeting back in 2007 hosted by uh, Nicholas Sturgeon, and there's a really good TED talk uh, that I encourage you to take a look at uh, from her about why we need a well-being economy. And she established the Wellbeing Economy Government Governments Initiative uh, in 2018. Uh, that includes uh, New Zealand, um, Scotland, um, Iceland, uh, and Finland and Wales has joined this initiative has had, and I think Canada has just joined. Uh, so <clears throat> how do we bring together all of these groups uh, to, that are focused now on, on well-being rather than merely GDP growth and uh, get them moving in the right direction? I encourage you to take a look at the We All website and the kinds of things that they are, are doing to help uh, move things along and to, and to join them as well. And finally, I'll end with a plug for a new master's program that we're doing here at uh, UCL uh, that's going to cover many of the topics uh, that I've talked about here, uh, including uh, courses that are that are aimed at student participation with other stakeholders in developing uh, natural prosperity kinds of initiatives. So thank you very much. Thanks to you, Professor Cassanza, for the very interesting talk. Maybe the next year program of the school can be an economy of 12 or 13 steps. So maybe we can think something about that. So um, without further delay, again, because we have very close time, I will introduce the, the first discussant, the UF Young discussant. She's Julia Widowin, a research assistant at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, Cambridge University. She's doing a PhD there. And she's also an Economy Francesco Academy Fellow because we have some fellowships uh, for uh, researchers, for young researchers in, uh, uh, in the Economy of Francesco. So, Giulia, the floor is uh, yours for your question or comment on Professor Costanza's uh, presentation. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Paolo. And um, thank you very much, Professor Costanza, for for packing in so, so many interesting points in quite a short space of time. And, and, bringing them together. And um, I've read a, I've, I've been reading a bit of your work, um, a bit related to my PhD, and also uh, thanks very much for, for passing on to us and the other participants of today's lecture, some of your papers. Um, and what really breaks through in your prolific writing is this orientation towards addressing problems at the centre um, and avoiding, well, I, the way I understand it, kind of avoiding addressing only a partial view of, of different problems or an isolated view of, of the whole picture that we're facing. 
Um, and it's complicated enough to try and get a full picture of, of what we might call the, the environmental crisis or the ecological crisis. We know there's lots of different kind of issues at play, but as we, as we know, and also, you know, intuit and, and what a lot of your work addresses is that this crisis is um, also deeply connected to a number of other crises outside of the natural or ecological sphere. So um, you, you alluded to some of them, social fragmentation, um, health crises, inequality, uh, poverty, different social dynamics. And so trying to capture all of that and, and getting a full picture of, of all of the different crises, well, that's really, that really is a challenging uh, task that we face. But um, what your presentation did today and, and, and your work more, more broadly is, I mean, it, it, it really lays out uh, these, these foundations for thinking about broader systems and, 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 and broader connections at play between, between all, these, um, all these different dimensions. Um, there's a lot of different socioeconomic frameworks and indicators out there now. Um, there is quite, there does seem to be um, quite a lot of momentum building around um, a, around sort of the broad concept of, of sustainable well-being, or there's there's lots of different terms for this. Um, some of these frameworks are focused on measuring well-being, like you said, as an end in itself, um, instead of aiming at uh, measuring growth as the ultimate end of, of concern. Um, some of them are aimed at measuring the the value of non-market goods. Um, so you know, the, the recognition that, that dimensions such as nature or relationships, um, different social dynamics have a, have a big a value to us, but they, but they don't have a price. And, um, and you, you've mentioned in your presentation, um, the, the, the sort of the, the methodologies and the techniques behind these uh, frameworks or indicators are still perhaps limited, but there's definitely progress happening in in that direction, um, you mentioned even in even in the mainstream economic approach, there's the, the, you know as you mentioned, there's the um, ecosystem services framework um, for for valuing um, for valuing non the, the non market sphere. The, in this case, nature uh, and, and well the natural sphere. There's also not only you know non market sphere, but also um, within the within the ecosystem services, there's also the measurement of cultural ecosystem services. So kind of these um, really intangible, um, intangible goods, things like feeling in inspired by nature, um, but it's difficult to measure. But so my first question is, what, what are we going to do with all of these um, different frameworks that seem to be working in the same direction, but there's really a lot of them around, and perhaps if that's creating um, uh, as a, a sense of fragmentation. I mean, should we be, in your opinion, should we be working towards one kind of dominant framework in the way that the that there's a there's a sort of dominant mainstream uh, economic framework, um, or is it or is it desirable to have you, you know a, a large number of different kind of frameworks or indicators uh, around um, at our disposal. Um, and kind of related to, to that question, and you've, you've talked about this a lot in your presentation. Um, yeah, there is, there is a lot, there is quite a lot of momentum in terms of these um, indicators and frameworks, but they, they're still kind of considered as heterodox economic approaches. They're still not the mainstream. And um, so, in, in your opinion, what's what's going to be the kind of the the catalyst that tips, um, you know, that tips the the balance in favor of um, a sort of socioeconomic framework becoming perhaps more more dominant in in uh, in, in, poly, in in different spheres of decision making. Um, my next question, uh, a little bit related to the the PhD <laughs> research I'm doing, so it's more out of personal interest is how how important in your opinion is is like a pluralistic approach to uh, environmental valuation so different ways of 
thinking about how to value, uh, how to how to um, capture the value of nature to to our to our well being, um, particularly in the context of a model that recognizes kind of planetary boundaries, uh, like the the one that, that you've presented, or Kate Rayworth, or these different um, these different frameworks. And and what difference can a pluralist kind of a, a plural approach make? in this context, is it helpful? Again, is it helpful in this context to have kind of a, a pluralist approach or, or is that creating the kind of um, division or dispersion that's um, perhaps a bit unproductive um, in this context? Um, my final think, thought or, or sort of... Uh, yeah, Julia, one second, because we have other to discuss and so time. I'm so yeah. sorry. Well, in that case, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for, for, the, for the presentation. So sorry to be the ruler of uh, this one. <laughs> so, Professor Costanza, if you want to reply, uh, or uh, yeah, and then we yeah. discuss the other discussions. Yeah. Maybe quickly, um, maybe in reverse order. Um, I think pluralism is important, and I think ecological economics is sort of based on that principle, but I think it has to be intelligent pluralism. Uh, so, you know, I think my, my basic rule is that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Uh, so we have to recognize that uh, and be able to distinguish, you know, what, what models are the, the most useful in this sort of pluralistic universe. And that, that relates to, um, I think, how we value uh, natural capital, ecosystem services, et cetera. I don't think there's a wrong way to do that, um, you know, but there is a right uh, but I think there, I mean, I don't think there's a right way to do that, <laughs> but there is a wrong way and that's not to, not to do it at all. And I think we have to uh, try many different approaches and recognize that they're not necessarily competing with each other, uh, that they're, there are, they are complementary, uh, and they're all trying to do uh, the, the same, this, solve the same sort of problem. Uh, and so we need to, to get out of what Deborah Tannen has called the argument culture. Uh, you know, which casts everything as a win-lose black-white debate uh, and more into a discussion, deliberation kind of culture where we, we recognize that there is no one right answer, you know, that, that all of these things contribute uh, in, in different ways to, to trying to solve uh, the problems. And I think you're right that um, <clears throat> my approach has been um, solutions-focused. In fact, we started a, a journal called Solutions. Uh, that tries to to uh, present uh, some some of these ideas and offer a venue for for more of that kind of thing. Um, and yet, you know, there are many different approaches uh, that are out there to, to to solving all of these problems. And I think that's where the uh, well-being economy alliance kind of approach comes in. Uh, the idea there was to recognize uh, that that these are not competing uh, approaches. Uh, they are all complementary. Uh, but unless uh, somebody puts in the effort. Uh, to, to glue them together, uh, they come across as being uh, competing and, and, uh, and diffuse the, the, uh, the effort and the attention and don't, don't allow for, uh, for very much progress. So I think, I think that's a very important step going forward is to be able to build a broad alliance of all of the groups, governments, individuals, et cetera, that are pursuing the, sh the same shared goal. And again, maybe it gets back to my fundamental point that what we're missing is consensus on the shared goal, uh, that that can motivate uh, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the other things that we're, that we're trying to do. And in, and in the absence of that shared goal, uh, you know, if we continue to pursue GDP as the goal, then the kinds of policies and, that, and things that we're talking about are, are, not, are not, uh, not contributing to that goal, but they are contributing to this, this broader shared goal of sustainable well-being. So getting consensus on that, I think, is a, is a really important first step. Uh, and then many other things I think can can follow on from that. Thank you, and thank you for those questions. Thank you also for the answers, Professor. I'm sorry that we didn't listen to Julia's last question, but I'm sure she will send you via, via mail maybe. Now, second discussion. We have uh, Tamiris Cristina Resente. She has a PhD in business administration, specialized in public management and government. She's in, uh, in Brazil, and now she has a uh, a business administration professor at Unileste, Meiji, Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora, which I for sure pronounce it badly. But Tamir, the floor is yours. Please be, be in time because we have a tight schedule. Okay. And thank you for being with us. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Robert Constanza. I would like to ask you some advices about how to care of this common asset that we have here in Brazil, that is the Amazon rainforest, because right now we have a lot of mining and deforestation and it's very complex because the Amazon is not only in Brazil. We have the Amazon rainforest also in some countries that make frontier with us in Latin America. So it's very complex and difficult. So my first question is about this. And my second question, I was uh, wondering when you showed up that equation, uh, we have in Brazil a wonderful natural capital, human capital, and built capital. But it seems that uh, we have a lack of social capital here be to create this well-being. I was, oh my God, we have almost everything, but still with a huge social inequality. So how in... Uh, a nation like Brazil that have almost all the ingredients can grow uh, into this well-being. So this is another of my questions. Thank you for those questions. And <clears throat> I think that's, uh, that's a big problem that we have around the world is the degradation of our social capital. And we know that social capital, the sense of community, people, people working together, uh, is a huge contributor to uh, to well-being and and also to our ability to manage our natural capital and to manage our our other other assets. So they all they all go together. Um, <clears throat> how to rebuild that social capital uh, once it's been lost, I think is is difficult. And <laughs> as you as you probably know, and part of it has to do with growing in economic inequality that makes that more difficult for those groups to come together. It makes more. Uh, you know, there's more uh, status competition, uh, but, you know, we have in the past uh, radically reduced inequality in many countries. And so we know how to do that with, with tax reform, you know, with redistribution of wealth. Um, I think also with, with uh, considering, again, back to this idea of, of the fundamental goal being sustainable well-being. You know, if we took that really seriously, uh, we would realize that inequality is not helping to improve well-being, uh, you know, it's really degrading it quite quite directly, and so that would motivate uh, some of these kinds of uh, policies that that I'm talking about of, re of uh, redistribution of wealth, etc. Tax the rich, you know, I mean, I think it's gotten ridiculous. That's that's the uh, the level of inequality that's out there, and this has to do with how we manage uh, assets like the like the Amazon, uh, which I think should be considered common community assets, uh, and they should be. Uh, we should develop uh, common asset trusts that can charge individuals and companies that damage those assets because they belong to all of us who can sort of implement uh, regular property rights rules, but on behalf of the, of the community, not, behalf, not on behalf of individuals. Uh, and, and so reduce the amount of private uh, ownership of these resources and increase the amount of, of uh, community ownership and community participation in the uh, in the governance and setting up the rules and enforcing the rules and, and uh, making sure that, uh, that, that the system is managed uh, for the benefit of, of uh, the sustainable well-being of, of the whole system to improve, you know, to maintain the quality of the asset uh, of the natural capital itself. Uh, so it, it can be done. And I think there are some, uh, some movements in that direction too, you know, with uh, the system in Costa Rica, for example, their payment for ecosystem services system functions somewhat like a common asset trust. Um, and I think they're currently involved in, in uh, doing the next iteration of that system, which will make a whole national scale uh, common asset trust out of the, the country. So um, <clears throat> doing things like that, I think could really, could really help. And it's what I said at the end, we need, we need better institutional design. You know, we cannot rely on uh, the market to solve these problems because they're not problems of allocation of, of uh, rival and excludable private goods, you know, it just doesn't fit. And we try to shoehorn some of these problems into a market solution, but it's just not going to work for, for many reasons. Uh, so we have to, you know, do what Peter Barnes has called capitalism 3.0. Uh, we have to reboot the system to something that recognizes that, yes, there are private goods and services. There's a market that we can use, you know, to our benefit, 
but there's also this whole range of, of assets that should be thought of as community assets, as common common assets, uh, and and there's there are then public assets at the uh, at the other extreme. So uh, <clears throat> it is going to take a paradigm shift. And maybe one of the questions uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from the previous speaker, uh, yeah, from from Julia uh, about what it would take to to uh, uh, to change the paradigm in economics. Um, I think that's that economics is addicted to their current paradigm as well as much as uh, as the whole system is. And you know those paradigms do change though when it becomes obvious that it's just not working any longer. And I think we we're pretty close to that to that recognition that we can no, can no longer continue to rely on the, the sort of conventional uh, economic view uh, to solve the the kinds of problems that we have now. Uh, so everything that we're all doing together, I think, can help to shift that paradigm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for the answer. And now the third discussant, a friend of economy, Francesco Filippo Blasi, he is an invited lecturer at the Sapienza University in Rome. So Filippo, please, the floor is yours, four or five minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, dear Professor Costanza, thank you for joining the economy of Francesco and what it represents for those uh, who have the goal uh, of the economy that respects biodiversity and consequently the needs of the poor. I would like briefly to introduce myself and stress the importance of your studies for my training and my profession. I'm an environmental scientist and a PhD researcher in analysis, protection and management of biodiversity. I've been involved for many years in ecological economics with particular reference uh, to the evaluation of marine ecosystem services and uh, uh, marine protected areas. As a student, I was fascinated by community ecology and environmental economics. And I was looking for a point of contact between the, the two disciplines in the belief that their union could give rise to a powerful tool uh, for the conservation of biodiversity and uh, uh, social equity. Uh, in those years in the Faculty of Environmental Sciences, there was still uh, no talk of ecosystem services. And your studies represented the, the conceptualization I was uh, looking for. Uh, now I deal with the evaluation of ecosystem services as indicators of sustainability of uh, uh, circular business models in the circular economy. I would like to draw some conclusion based on what you said and uh, to underline the importance of your speech and more generally of your research activities activities in the spirit of that uh, animate uh, the economy of Francesco and the Magisterium of Pope Francis on ecology. Finally, I would like to ask you a question about uh, what you said. Firstly, I would like to stress the importance of the measuring of the ecosystem services and to give them a monetary value. This will allow, allow us to encourage public policy aimed at the conservation of ecosystems and uh, at quantifying the cost to the poor of the environmental uh, damage. Some aspect of your speech, Professor Costanza, struck me. As you pointed out that scientists are aware of the ongoing environmental changes, but the society has not yet changed its behavior. This also touches on an aspect that it has always troubled me since I was a student the scale and the speed of the environmental changes underway and the dramatic nature of their consequences. And the fact that society does not seem to be aware of this. And your presentation offers a solution to this. I was struck by your speech that the positive change of society should not be imposed, but that it is important to support the participant autonomy. Now I come to the question. As you explained it, as uh, ecosystems have threshold levels and people as well as, as, well as businesses uh, seem unaware that if ecosystem, ecosystems collapse, they are not longer able in a perpetual way to provide the quantity and the quality of ecosystem services as before. This aspect, the, that of threshold levels is a matter also underlined by Pope Francis in his message to the economy of Francesco. 
The question is therefore as follows. How can we make the proposed model institutionally as well implemented and effective in the short term, given the speed of the, of the environmental change and the risk of exceeding threshold levels with the irreversible consequences? Okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> I think we do have some some short term uh, things that we need to do, and particularly ha having to do with uh, with climate, uh, but also with growing inequality and growing and growing poverty. And one one proposal that we've made is to create a um, an atmospheric trust. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and and I think Pope Francis could really help with this. Actually, if we could get um, the Pope to say that the atmosphere belongs to all of us. Uh, and that if we if we uh, claim that re responsibility and say that anyone who damages the atmosphere needs to pay for those damages, uh, so it gives an overarching institutional framework <clears throat> for charging uh, fossil fuel companies in particular uh, to pay for those for those damages. But those funds then could go into a trust that could be used to reduce poverty to um, to uh, reduce the impacts of the uh, uh, environmental change by restoring forests, replanting wetlands, et cetera. You know, so sequestering carbon, uh, encouraging um, you know, faster uh, transition to renewable energy, both by uh, imposing economic costs on the fossil fuel sector, but also by direct investment in, in solar and wind um, energy and, and investment. So I think it's <clears throat> something that we could do in the short term that um, I'm not sure that uh, you know, the international agreements uh, are really going to be enough because it's sort of leaving it to governments that are too much influenced by the fossil fuel sector, for example, uh, to really to really make the kind of transition that's that's necessary. I mean, we're subsidizing fossil fuels still at, at just ridiculous rates. You know, I mean, if we would just end the subsidies, uh, the, you know, the uh, that would that would probably do most of the, the trick in sort of and wrap, uh, making this transition rapidly. Uh, but I think it also has to do with how, you know, those, those transition costs are distributed and how we use the funds more, most effectively uh, in order to make that transition a just one and one that, that really is uh, to the benefit of, uh, of, of everyone on the planet. And I think it is possible to do that, but it's gonna take, I think, designing uh, an institution uh, that's, that really has that as its fundamental goal. Um, one um, book I could recommend uh, for you all that I think would be really that's that's one of my favorites in this in this genre is uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's book called uh, The Ministry for the Future, and this is kind of a science fiction book written into you know it's, it's about the near term future and how these problems manifest themselves and also some of the some of the solutions that could that could potentially. Uh, come come and come to pass, and it's written in a very engaging narrative narrative sort of way. Uh, so I think it's uh, I think it's it would be a good one to take a look at to to uh, <clears throat> to give you some hope that the problems are still still solvable. But I think it is going to take uh, some really uh, different approaches. And I think this idea of a atmospheric trust. Uh, also, I think we need a trust for the oceans uh, that that could do the same sort of thing. And um, you know, if um, if Pope Francis would get on board with this idea, I think that would be great. So just pass that along. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, Professor Stanz. <laughs> yeah, we will tell him uh, in in a season in September when <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Francesco event. <laughs> so now uh, to to conclude, we have uh, um, a, a final remarks from the scientific coordinator of the Economy of Francesco, Professor Luigi Bruni who has joined us and today is also his birthday. So we are happy to have him uh, with us. So if Professor Bini yes. wants yeah. <laughs> Thank you, but after 18, uh, after 18, the birthday is not a good day usually for, for uh, elderly people like me. But thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, Professor Costanza. Thank you, all the intervenients, the, the, the discussion. Just, uh, my my words are just to say thank you to Professor Costanza for your uh, contribution to the economy of Francesco, this uh, movement of young economists all over the world. Because uh, this year, the, the choice of the, the plant capitalism is, was not an easy choice because it's not a popular uh, 
topic uh, in economics uh, or in business uh, and then we really thank uh, the, the few scholars uh, that are working on that uh, because uh, your uh, contribution is very precious also papa francesco is very happy with this idea of uh, listening to plants but why just to 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 two words on that why we chose this idea of of uh, vegetal um, capitalism or plants uh, capitalism because uh, if the difference the, the huge the basic differences between plants uh, and humans uh, and animals uh, are that plants are stuck in the in the in the field uh, whereas uh, humans can run uh, can escape uh, in um, during crisis uh, during uh, fire or so and so today there is not planet b that means that as individuals we can run we can move from italy to us or we can move from uh, ukraine to poland okay as individuals as a, as a communities but as a humanity we are like plants uh, stuck in the in the earth and then we have to start to really learn how to survive without running uh, without escaping and then the intelligence of plants is particularly important today because we are not, we, there is not a planet B. And also the main attempts we know today in uh, ecological economics, uh, in, uh, in uh, circular economics, uh, transition economics, so and so, green, the different uh, idea of sustainability of green economy, most of them remain within the animal paradigm. The idea that we can move, we can we can escape, we can do. And do. I think our uh, our ambition in this uh, series of seminar is to try to think more radically about a paradigm shift from animals to plants, because there is no planet B. Then we have to learn how to survive without escaping. And then. Uh, we are really thankful uh, to professors, to scholars uh, who help us uh, in, uh, in working and thinking about this huge, uh, huge research project. And uh, thank you, Professor Costanza. Thank you, um, young colleagues. Thank you, Paolo, Valentina, and all the staff for the organizing this beautiful afternoon in Europe. I don't know, in, maybe in America or Asia is different, but uh, it's not afternoon, but uh, it's beautiful anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bruni. Professor Costanza, you have a quick reaction to that, or should I conclude? I think you can conclude. Thank you, Lu Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Lucino, and, and happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I still feel bad that Julia didn't do the, the question, so I will personally make sure that, 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 that she will send you her last question. So, two announcements, very quick. First, about the next appointment of the Economy of Francesco School because it's going to uh, it's going to be on the 27th of June with professor Simon Al Levine or Levin uh, is a professor in ecological ecology and evolutionary biology so we are still continuing to exploring these different paradigms and then to all the participants to all the followers of this webinar a reminder that in next September we are going to meet finally in Assisi with the global economy of francesco event from uh, uh, from 22nd to 24th of the of uh, september three days in which we finally meet and we will try to continue this process this collective thinking and collective practice to to transform the economy so thank you very much to all don't forget to register for the event also professor costanza if he wants to join let, let us know we will be happy to, to have you there in assisi and uh, so thanks again to everyone to professor costanza of the discussions Professor Bruni, and see you all. Bye, and thank you. Ciao. Bye.